microbes eat the dead ones. They clean up dead material and convert it into into other material. Do you think that what you have could be used in the Gulf? Oh, we, we put in a proposal to do that, yes. Um, our, our water treatment uh, formula was developed by, um, partly developed by an individual, uh, Dr. Colosito in Bakersfield, and he was working, uh, treating um, oil, oil field problems all through Bakersfield and in that area. So he's been doing uh, oil cleanup for a long time. We have a real diverse mixture of microbes in our mix that goes after. We have stuff in there that goes after almost everything. Uh, they, they went after the, the um, sulfur compounds. They went after the metals. They went after um, all the other really bad stuff, and it, it rebalances the water column. Do you think it could go after Corexit? Oh, Corexit. Oh, absolutely, the, the toxic chemicals. Yes. Absolutely. These things eat everything. See, that's why I don't understand why BP is allowed to drive the whole operation in the Gulf. They have acted almost at the level of criminality the way this has been handled, and why are they given the power to continue right no. there? Why are they managing it? One interesting thing that came up about that uh, had, to, had, to do with, um, had to do with growing algae in the futures in biofuel. And that if they, it almost looked like, well, in fact, the story was that they wanted to turn the whole Gulf into algae production per biofuel. And if you go and look at, at who is invested in biofuels, it's all the same players. So are they trying to destroy a huge e- ecosystem just to grow algae for biofuel? It's, I, I, I found it a fascinating idea, <laughs> and it kind of looked like what they were up to. Uh, otherwise, it makes no sense why they were allowed to do any of that. Why they're allowed to manage it yeah. after why the would problems. You want to, why would you want to break your oil up into particles that went down into the ecosystem and kind of disappear just to, just to get rid of it? Make everybody think everything's honky-donky? Well, a lot of that stuff goes right into the soil, like, you know, the Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska. There's still oil uh, soaked into the, to the soils. Well, I know from the treatments we've done with our products that uh, our, the microbes go right down into the soil and go after it. You know that this is the first time this year that I learned the level at which oil companies do deep level drilling for oil under the sea. I I never knew that. No, I never knew that. I always associated in my mind drilling for oil on land, Yeah. not into the sea. I would have assumed there would have been a very different protocol for making sure that it's safe. Well, one would think so. And I, all the environmental laws we've had, I mean, it flies in the face of everything I've ever done under any of the laws, you know, for the department. Project reviews, reporting, all the rest of it, it was pretty stringent. Well, these guys are free to do anything they want. It's actually, it's, uh, it's crazy. Did you enjoy working for the California Department of Fish and Game? Actually, I did. I love my job, I, you know, because I love the resources, and I was really glad to be out there. I tended to be a little... I think one of the county administrators said to me the other day, he says, well, I could believe this. He says, you were always very sensitive about resource issues. So, <laughs> 38 years is a long time. That's more than most people are married. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's a real marriage, isn't it? I was married to him. Yeah, 38 years plus yeah. I was married to that. And um, it, was hard to, it was hard to leave it. Would you go back if you could? No, I really like the microbe tech uh, and the microbial cleanup. I wanted to do something. All that time, I got really frustrated not being able to really do anything. You know, what you got on mitigations on projects, it ne- I was never really satisfied with the whole environmental process. It, it ends up being something that incrementally just keeps going, moving on. By the time you think, oh, this is all it's going to be for now, and you try to set areas aside, you find out later they weren't. Uh, people ignore all that stuff. Uh, it doesn't work. It hasn't been working. Everybody likes to think it is, but it's not. And we end up with, with situations like we're in right now. It's an incremental loss of everything until, you know, people actually are taking over. I think between the, the aerosol spraying programs of the air and the defilement of the air, in combination with HARP and in combination with genetically modified seeds and fluoridating and putting other chemicals in water, I really think that those are the keys to a flourishing civilization to deal with that directly. Yeah, well, no, we should be. 
we should be. But there's obviously some other program going on that the rest of us aren't being allowed to be in. And, you know, I, I was thinking it really looked like a genocide program to me. The longer I look at it, the more it looks like that. I, mean, I suppose, you know, we, we've been pressing our resources with the number of people we have. And, you know, I've got to thinking, gosh, what if I had, what if I was a ruler of the world? And what would be my, what would be my, my biggest dilemma? Well, we've been pretty much aware of it in the resources for a long time that it's population control, uncontrolled population growth. Okay? How do you control that? You start looking around at the, the religion ba- uh, bases and, and what people do and don't want to do. You'd never get it done. I mean, how would you change it? You'd almost have to go over the top, which it looks like they're doing. But I have a suspicion it's not for our benefit. It really looks like somebody else's private program that they want to just basically take over everything. I was told by an astrophysicist right before he passed away last year that you could take all the people in the United States and put them in Texas. And that the whole concern for population is unmerited. It is irrational. There is so much land. There is so much available. Tim, the amount of land that's available versus what you can do with that land is a different thing. We have, so we're going to tear down all our forests to grow crops. We're going to, you know, we're going to change, you know, irrigate the deserts and change all our climate. Anything you do, that's limited. I'm sorry, I disagree with your, your friend. I didn't say it's unlimited. I'm saying that he said you could take all the people in the United States and put them in Texas. It is an irrational concern. You couldn't put all the people in Texas and live. The point is that he's saying that it has been escalated. Yeah. Yeah, that's all. Look at the people here and how we're using our resources. What's happened to our fishery? Well, I mean, aside from the other environmental impacts going on from these covert sure. programs. Yeah, yes, of course. Well, we were overfishing everything. We have, we're overusing everything. We're actually changing our whole land base, and we're, we're destroying our natural resources for artificial production. I went to Trader Joe's the other day, and someone asked me to pick up a certain type of a fish, and I realized that it was farmed. It wasn't even real fish. Well, farmed fish can be okay if, you know, depending on how they're raised. I don't, I don't have a problem with farmed fish. The only problem that I had with the farmed salmon in the, in the exclosures out in the, in the ocean was that they're getting, my, they're getting uh, uh, different parasites that live right in the, they can't, since the fish aren't mobile, the parasites move into the pens. And then when the natives come by, they catch them too. And that's been depleting our populations. But it's mostly over harvest, and if you start looking at uh, at the fish, the the orange ruffies, and and a lot of the other fish that are on the market now, those were scrap fish, deep water ocean fish that nobody ever used, or rarely used. We've depleted our stock so much. We're using we're using fish we that were trash fish. And that's what they were considered. I never thought orange ruffy was considered a trash fish. That's fascinating. I never knew that. Oh yeah. It's really good, though. <laughs> oh, well, even even what was considered trash fish then uh, are edible. <laughs> it's it's just that the the idea is that we are we've depleted our resources so badly yes. that um, I don't think we could take many more population and keep our resources intact. To be honest, so if there is a population program going on, and it seems like there is, I think Agenda Twenty One really does exist. Yeah, We don't have any say about it. It's just going on, and it's affecting everybody on land, right? Well, think about the haze. Um, the haze on the ground, the silver haze. I'm a sensitive to this stuff. I am, I too. I get up in the morning, and I go outside. I have a little routine I do. I go feed the cats and, you know, and get some water and, and do some things outside. I have to haul my own water in, so I have my drinking water and barrels outside. But anyway, I go out and do that, and I'm not out there a minute, and my eyes are watering, and my nose is running. I mean, my run- nose runs like a faucet for 10, 15 minutes every day, and it's like, uh, this is too much. I-, I really hate it. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show to talk to us about your background and what you're doing and what you found, and next week we're going to be talking to G. Edward Griffin and Michael Murphy about what in the world are they spraying a little bit deeper into their film. And I just really thank you for joining us and hope that you'll come back again and talk to us, maybe with Rosalind. That would be great. You're more than welcome. And um, this is something I feel deeply as part of my public service is to let people know. So I'm, I'm, you know, I 
that's why I decided to go to the UN and why I'm putting a lot of information out. And and I, I have 